Nah. Hi everyone and welcome to week five's Google Hangout. Um, thank you for staying with us for the duration of the course. I know for some of you the materials that you've seen over the last few weeks have been emotionally quite difficult to deal with um, and I appreciate you staying with us. Um, this week we're going to be looking at the welfare of wild animals, uh, mostly in captivity. Um, and what I just want to re-emphasize is that whilst a lot of the discussions this week have been about zoo animals, um, these problems really aren't unique to zoos. So a lot of the welfare issues that we see can be found not just in zoos, but also in sanctuaries um, and private animal collections as well. And actually some of the footage that you probably saw this week that you found quite difficult to watch was actually filmed in sanctuaries, um, which brings us to a bit of an ethical dilemma when we consider that the aim of those um, facilities is to actually rescue wild animals from situations of poor welfare. Um, so it's important to remember um, that this can apply to any facility that houses wild animals in captivity. Okay, so I've looked over some of the questions that have been submitted on this week's discussion board and Frith has been helping me with that um, and we're going to be answering um, some of those questions but also if you're watching live and you do have any questions that uh, come to mind as we're going through then please do um, pop them up on the hangout and we'll do our best to answer those as well. So the first question that um, I'm going to answer is, is uh, a bit of an introduction really to some of the work that we do. We were asked um, about the work that we do in captive wildlife welfare and the kind of research that we do um, and also how we safeguard the welfare of animals uh, that we may use in research. I think traditionally the idea of animals being used in research has been perceived very negatively by the public. But a lot of the research that we do here at Edinburgh and also at SRUC is actually behavioural research. So it's very non-invasive. It often um, requires simply observing the animals and evaluating their responses to different stimuli. So for example, we could do an enrichment trial give animals new types of enrichment or different choices of bedding um, and see what they prefer. That would be a preference test. We could, um, in terms of an enrichment trial, evaluate the animal's behavior before, during and after a particular enrichment is given. And this can give us useful information to evaluate whether an enrichment is actually working or not. We also do a lot of research that is related to public engagement and education. And at the moment, um, I'm doing a PhD part time, which involves um, looking at the attitudes and knowledge of people who work in zoos in China and also across Europe um, and looking at their attitudes towards different controversial practices involving animals in zoos, but also their knowledge and understanding of animal welfare and animal behavioral needs and how we can work together to improve the, the management of captive wild animals in zoos. Um, from a legal perspective, any research that we do is um, under the Animal Scientific Procedures Act in the UK if it involves an invasive procedure on an animal. Most of the research that we do uh, doesn't come under that act because we don't tend to do invasive procedures, but some of the behavioural research, some of the nutritional research, particularly done at SRUC, may need an Animal Scientific Procedures Act licence. Um, that's a very, very stringent uh, licensing and, and legal uh, piece of legislation um, that is, is monitored by the Home Office in the UK. Across Europe, there's also um, Laboratory Animals Directive from the European Parliament. That, for example, uh, prohibits the use of great apes in um, toxicology testing or um, invasive research testing. And that was something that was changed in 2013. So there's um, a whole variety of different types of legislation that safeguard um, animals that might be used in research um, by different facilities. In terms of behavioural research that might be done in zoos, then norm normally zoos will have ethics and welfare committees and they may work with other institutions. So for example, Edinburgh works with the RZSS and Natalie Warren, who you saw earlier in the course, um, sits on the animal welfare committee for RZSS and evaluates any behavioural research which may be done on the zoo animals there. So we have a whole variety of different checks and balances to ensure that any research that we do is robust and also that it's for the benefit of the animals um, and isn't um, creating a, a welfare problem. So I hope that that answers that question. But if there are any more questions along those lines, then please do uh, pop them up. Okay, so I'm just going to um, glance to the side and have a look at some other questions that we, that we have popping up on the boards. So um, 
one of the questions that was raised was really more of an ethical question and I know that we've not really covered ethics in any uh, great detail in this course. Um, ethics is, is interesting because our own ethical framework um, will um, allow us to make value judgments about different situations and about what we think is acceptable or not acceptable. And it's really, really important that we distinguish between ethics and welfare because quite often we'll have an idea of something, we'll, have a, we'll make a moral judgment about a situation, but that doesn't necessarily um, impact on the welfare of an animal. So hunting is a really good example of that. A lot of us will have an emotional response to the idea of hunting. If you're um, somebody who is very empathetic towards animals, you're probably more inclined to dislike the idea of hunting, and particularly the idea of hunting animals for sport. However, if we look at, for example, the hunting of white-tailed deer in the US, white-tailed deer are a growing wildlife population. A lot of their natural predators have been eliminated from many parts of the United States. And so there's no natural population control and their population is growing and growing. Because of that, in many parts of the US, um, it's legal to hunt them in a variety of circumstances. And if you are a hunter and you kill your deer cleanly, then from a welfare perspective, we're looking at an animal that has a good life and a humane death. And so from an animal welfare science perspective, there's very little there that we can criticize. From an ethical perspective, you may disagree with the consumption of meat or you may disagree with the killing of wildlife, and that's absolutely fine. We'll, all of us will have our own opinions on whether we think that's acceptable or not acceptable. But from a welfare perspective, no suffering has occurred to that animal. And so it's really important when we're looking at some of these controversial topics that we separate our own value judgments and our own ethical frameworks from actually what the animal is experiencing. And yes, in many of these cases, we would probably consider that the animal, if it had a choice, would choose to live. But what we're looking at is the animal's experience, whether it experiences anything which is a negative welfare. So does it experience pain or suffering or stress? And in many cases, we might consider that in some circumstances animals which are hunted actually suffer less stress or less pain or discomfort than animals which are farmed. And yet often we'll have a much more emotional response to hunting than we would to farming. That's a generalization and of course everybody will have their own opinions on those situations. But the reason I'm raising that is because one of the questions that was raised was about the ethics of canned hunting and this is a practice which is quite common in South Africa. And again, we'll all have our own ethical viewpoints on that, and I'm going to try and put my own aside so that we can talk about this and explore all of the angles. Canned hunting is where um, game reserves raise usually carnivores, uh, but they'll raise other species as well. Um, and then those animals are essentially uh, raffled off to the highest bidder. You can buy a canned hunting ticket, which allows you into the reserve and then gives you a license to shoot that particular animal. And lion canned hunting is probably the most common practice in terms of the canned hunts in South Africa. Obviously, because those animals are in a game reserve, they're in a fenced area. So they can't follow their natural migration patterns. They're perhaps uh, not as skilled as, as uh, migrating or moving through habitat as an animal that's truly in the wild. Um, and so they can't really often escape from the hunter. So there's an ethical conflict there in terms of, is it really a fair a fair game? Is it is it fair to the animals if they are fenced in and they don't have um, an escape route available to them? Um, but from a, a welfare perspective, we could argue that these animals are bred, they're fed, they are offered shelter and protection um, from the elements, and then when they are killed, ideally, if the hunter is competent, they should be killed with a clean shot. They shouldn't be stressed or chased or um, feel any pain or discomfort. And so from a welfare perspective, is there a problem with canned hunting? And that's really challenging. And this is where the, the crossover between welfare and ethics becomes really difficult. Another ethical consideration that we might want to think about is the message that canned hunting sends. If you can put a price on the life of an animal, what is the value of that animal? And is it just monetary? If we look at the life of a lion, animals which perhaps zoos around the world are trying to conserve and protect and promote as being something that we want to look after, then how does canned hunting conflict with the message of preservation and conservation that zoos send?
So that's something else we want to think about is our conservation ethics. What message are we sending to the general public? And some of you may have been aware of that kind of debate that happened earlier this year when a male black rhino was auctioned off to a hunter in Texas. Um, and that was actually a decision that was supported by the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation, because the money that was generated from that practice um, was said to be put back into conservation of black rhino. But if a hunter is allowed to kill an animal for a price, does that devalue the species as a whole? If it's okay for a hunter to kill an animal because they've paid $200,000, why is it not okay for somebody who is starving or is trying to feed their family to poach that animal um, in order to feed their family or to sell that animal onto a hunter? And this is one of the issues we face with things like the rhino trade, is that we get a lot of poaching because the value of rhino horn is more worth weight for weight more than gold, and so we get a lot of um, indigenous poaching of rhinos to be sold on higher up the chain because um, their value is, is extreme. So can we justify hunting a rhino that's supported by the IUCN but not justify hunting a rhino um, for its horn for the illegal wildlife trade? Um, I think a lot of these ethical decisions excuse me, are, are quite difficult once we try and tease them out. Do we have any hunting? Do we have controlled hunting? Is it okay to hunt the meat, but not to hunt uh, the trophies? Is trophy hunting okay if the money goes back into conservation? It's very difficult, isn't it? And from the welfare of the animal point of view, you need to think about what they're going to experience. So in the UK, um, and I'm hoping you can hear me well enough, I'm just quite a long way away. In the UK, uh, we have the shooting of game birds is a very common form of hunting. Um, and there are different types of those, but there are grouse which are kept and bred on, on moorlands, and there are also um, pheasants and uh, partridge which are specifically bred in almost battery style cages in order to be released in huge numbers for people to shoot them. Now, my question is not necessarily the welfare of the animal being shot, although, because it's very, very relatively quick, it can obviously go wrong, so sometimes animals when they're being shot cannot be shot cleanly. But my question would be the welfare of the animal up to that point, and very much like farming, the welfare of the breeding stock. So you've got animals that are in cages their whole lives, very, very small cages without very much room to move, they don't necessarily have mate choice, um, they don't have protection, often pheasants are outside, they don't have protection from wind, rain or sun, and yet um, we don't think about those, we're only thinking about the ones that are being shot. So again, like we've said in the week on farming, it's not always that the, well, the animal who is going to be eaten, or in this case shot, which may be eaten, um, is, is not necessarily always the, the, the bit that has the most challenge, the, the animals are going to have the most welfare challenge, whereas the breeding animals or the animals that are spending long term in a, in a poor environment may have a, a higher welfare challenge. Of course, those animals that are released may not be used to fending for themselves, don't know what a road is, can't cope with predators and all of those things, so you have lots of, lots of other additional problems for those that are released. But just in terms of thinking about the ethics of it all and the welfare of it all, welfare of the breeding stock might actually be worse than those that are released and shot. Mm -hmm. And actually there are some parallels in terms of farming with some aspects of what we call sustainable use of wildlife. And some of you may have heard of this term sustainable use. Um, and this is something that um, is particularly prevalent in Southern Africa. And canned hunts are sometimes used as an example of sustainable use because the lions are breeding continuously and then the progeny are being shot in those canned hunts. But other examples of sustainable use of wildlife can include or apparent sustainable use of wildlife which are proposed are things like rhino farming, tiger farming and bear farming which all occur across Asia. Um, we know from research that's been done that none of those industries are actually sustainable and are, they are actually a, a drain on wild resources. But um, the promotion of these apparent sustainable terms can actually breed market demand for a product. So, for example, since bear bile farming was introduced in the 1980s, the demand for bear bile across Asia has massively increased. 
because it's become uh, almost an acceptable product mm -hmm. because it's farmed. Um, and but that increased demand has also led to increased pressures on wild bears and increased habitat degradation and increased illegal bear trade. So um, that move towards what was thought to be a sustainable industry has actually place more pressure on those fragile wild populations. And that's potentially something that we need to be careful of with things like hunting and canned hunts as well as those unforeseen consequences. We can set out to do something which we think will conserve a population, but actually may put more stress on that population as well as creating these ethical and welfare dilemmas. Move on. Why not? Oh, we've question. got a question that's just popped up. Sorry, so we've just had a question that's popped up. If we had the choice to reintroduce wild animals in zoo captivity into the wild, despite being healthy and having adequate enrichment within a zoo, would it be a better choice for these wild animals in the long run? Wow, that's a, a pretty, pretty enormous question, actually. Um, let me just... I'm, oh, sorry. It's a, sorry, we're just having a slight technical challenges. Okay, so that's selected. Um, okay, um, so... Basically, the question is, is it better for the animal's welfare if they have the choice to live in captivity with all their needs provided for versus to be released into the wild, which would be the better option for them? And that's basically an impossible question to answer. When we're looking at how animals cope with captivity, then we have to look at the individual. And quite often, um, when we look at how zoos originated back in the early days of menageries, 100, 150 years ago, the majority of the animals that came into zoos were harvested from the wild. And even people like Gerald Dorrell, who later set up Jersey Zoo, went out and collected those animals from their native environments. Um, the animals that didn't cope with the challenges of captivity died, basically. Um, and the animals that could cope with the challenge, challenges of captivity became part of our more sustainable breeding populations that zoos housed today. So already, to some degree, those animals have been selected to cope with captivity. And the um, elements of their characters, their temperaments, their personalities, which allow them to cope better with things like restricted environments or proximity to humans, um, may not be the same character characteristics that would make them successful in a wild environment. So while zoos aim to retain the majority of the genetic diversity, within their captive populations, and well-managed stud books will do this, there is an element of selection for animals that will cope with a captive environment, because animals that don't cope with the demands we place upon them in captivity simply die off. Um, of course, zoos also run captive breeding and reintroduction programs, and there are um, animals which are reintroduced into the wild. Somebody um, put up a video this week on the discussion boards of an example from the Aspinall Foundation, which breeds gorillas at Howlett Zoo down in Kent in the UK, and those uh, gorillas are translocated across to Western Africa and successfully rehabilitated and reduced, uh, reintroduced into the wild. And there are many, many examples of zoos um, that either support conservation initiatives in um, natural areas of natural habitat or that actually um, breed animals for wild reintroduction. Often those animals which are being bred for wild reintroduction are not the animals that you see when you visit a zoo. A lot of zoos will have captive breeding collections that they manage off show because the animals which are being bred for reintroduction to the wild don't cope as well with being exhibited to the public. And what we want is for those animals to really be um, managed in a way that is suitable to allow them to um, be successful in the wild environment. The wild environment has its challenges. They have predation, there is exposure to the elements, potentially lack of food source, droughts, flooding, um, lots of environmental challenges that those animals will have to deal with. Finding their own food, establishing breeding groups, um, protecting home ranges or territory depending on the species. And so all of those things will challenge that animal's welfare. Hopefully, if it's adapted to that environment, it will cope with those challenges. Similarly, maintaining animals in captivity challenges their welfare because of the confinement, because of the lack of choices that we are able to offer them, the lack of breeding opportunities, the lack of enrichment choices, etc., etc., that we've already discussed in some of our educational materials this week. Whether one is better than the other, we really can't say. It would be a very subjective opinion, I think, on, on whether 
one particular circum one particular circumstance is better for an animal than another. It's a bit like some of the things Haley talked about in her week is a pet, a much loved pet at home in the UK that's potentially fat and has a restricted dietary choice and restricted exercise choices, but is very much loved. Is that um, a better or a worse welfare situation than a street dog in India that is very much more exposed to disease and trauma and all of those unpleasant things, but has much more behavioural choices open to it? So these are questions that we have to ask ourselves, regardless of the animal industry that we work with. Okay, there's um, some questions about um, what happens with the uh, animals when they're humanely euthanized um, and what happens to the carcass, mm. feeding carcasses to other animals in the zoo. Yeah, and we've had lots of discussion about the Marius issue this week, um, but I'm not going to talk about that because we've had lots of discussion board activity on that subject. Mm -hmm. Um, but in terms of the practicalities of what happens, it's really variable depending on the individual zoo and also depending on the species. So we have a number of ways. I'm a veterinarian, uh, which I, I hope you've, you've got from the discussion board, but we have um, a number of ways of euthanizing animals humanely depending on the situation and also depending on the species. If you think about it, euthanasia of something like an elephant is going to be very, very different to euthanasia of a fish or an amphibian, an invertebrate, um, or a reptile. And particularly in the lower vertebrates, reptiles, fish, amphibians, and invertebrates, actually being able to tell that an animal is dead and is clinically brain dead um, is, can sometimes be a challenge. And that's a huge, sometimes a welfare challenge. So back in ye olden days, for example, it used to be acceptable to use decapitation as a method of euthanizing reptiles. I'm sorry if this is a little bit graphic for some of you. Um, that was uh, certainly stopped in the UK in recent times because studies have shown that because reptiles um, are able to retain their cognitive function, even when oxygen levels are very low, they've got such slow metabolisms that their brains just keep working for quite a long time, that if you, for example, decapitated a tortoise, the tortoise would be able to view its own severed body for quite a while because its brain function does not stop for sometimes several hours after decapitation. Mm -hmm. And so it's still cognitively aware of everything that's going on around it. That's a, obviously an enormous welfare issue and we would never want an animal to experience that. But this kind of ending means that we are able to develop better methods of dealing with these problems to ensure that animals don't suffer. But this understanding is very important in order to be enab enabled to be able to perform humane euthanasia where it's indicated. In terms of animals that are healthy, which may be called for population control measures, which is quite common as we've discussed, um, those animals may be fed back to carnivores. Um, and if that's going to happen, then they would normally be killed by captive bolt or gunshot or blunt force trauma. Um, all of which can be humane depending on the size of the animal um, and normally would be done in a very stress-free environment. Um, certainly, you know, if we look at cattle in a slaughterhouse, they're normally killed by stunning captive bolt um, and then moving on to, to, to slaughter methods. Um, the, the euthanasias of large animals that I've seen in zoos are extremely humane and, and immediate um, and those animals could then be fed back to carnivores without a risk of chemical con contamination from drugs. If an animal has been sick and has been treated with drugs, then it wouldn't ever be fed back because of that risk to carnivores. And, and there have unfortunately been examples of that, that occurring. Um, so although this is obviously an unpleasant subject to talk about and not something that you know we like to think about, humane euthanasia can be a necessary tool in preventing suffering of animals, particularly older zoo animals, and particularly animals that might have been on medications or been treated unsuccessfully for, for different illnesses or injuries. And so it's important that we do consider that process and how it's managed to make it as stress-free as possible and to ensure that animal welfare is safeguarded through that process. A lot of the time the keeping staff will be involved and they'll be able to reassure a particular animal or um, as is often the case with some of the larger animals, uh, they can be given food and treats during that process so that it's as unchallenging as possible in terms of their welfare. When you have a carcass, I was wondering, um, there's some questions on the board there about what actually happens afterwards. So obviously you're saying some of them do get fed, mm. but not always. 
Yeah, that's right. And often for animals that are, um, for example, suffering from diseases or that aren't suitable for being fed uh, back to the zoo, then there are lots of things that can happen with the bodies. Um, obviously, we have to look at public health and making sure that um, there's no contamination of the environment in terms of carcass disposal, particularly if they've um, had drugs. But a lot of the time, those bodies can be very, very useful in terms of um, furthering our knowledge and understanding of the anatomy, physiology, um, and, and the various processes of those animals. And this was actually something that occurred with Marius, although it wasn't publicized heavily in the media. And um, those um, remains are very useful in the UK, for example. The National Museum of Scotland has an enormous zoological carcass collection. And those carcasses are used for a variety of DNA research, for conservation research, um, and for um, different types of anatomy and physiology research so that we can learn more about the normal aspects of these animals and what kinds of diseases they might suffer from. Similarly, the Natural History Museum in London has a huge repository of different um, animal skeletons and structures, and we can learn much more about the normal variation of different types of exotic animals that wouldn't otherwise be available to us. So um, all of that research has fed back into our ability to be able to provide better for these animals in the captive environment. So a lot of zoos will um, work with um, universities, with museums, and with research institutes to provide research material so that we can learn more about these animals. And that's what will happen in the most part. OK, well, I think the next question um, was looking at breeding wild animals in captivity and uh, reproductive frustration. Yeah, that's something that came up. Um, again, this is a really challenging question. So the question was um, about the fact that often we we routinely neuter our dogs and cats, certainly in the UK, some parts of Europe and the US and Australia. This is something that is advocated by the veterinary profession. Um, it's much less common in uh, northern Europe and Scandinavian countries, and their breeding restriction is normally physical or behavioural, so the dogs will be confined um, rather than um, spayed or neutered. Traditionally, the veterinary profession has advocated neutering as something that promotes the health and welfare of, of our pets, and in some cases that's absolutely the case. But there is an increasing body of research that suggests that for some dogs particularly, um, neutering at an early age can increase their risks of some types of cancer or of musculoskeletal disease. And so this is an emerging area of research in terms of the physical benefits or drawbacks of neutering in our pets. But it's still something that we haven't fully explored and we need to be aware that just because we've been recommending something for a long, long time as a profession, that it's not necessarily always going to be that way. Often, as with any welfare situation, we have to look at the individual rather than the population. Um, we also have the dilemma of, um, so as we mentioned in Scandinavia, people will confine their pets rather than neuter them. Is this better or worse? Do those animals that have an urge to reproduce but which aren't allowed to, is that better or worse for them? Even though they're physically intact, they're potentially behaviorally frustrated. Is that better or worse than having a surgery that is really of, of you know, debatable benefit to them? That's a, another ethical um, argument that, that we need to consider as pet owners. But relating that back to our situation of wild animals in captivity, um, we need to remember that these aren't domestic animals. The domestic dog has been bred over generations and generations to have um, its primary relationship as um, it's the human dog bond as its primary relationship. And that's why we see problems such as separation anxiety in dogs. We don't see those problems with zoo animals or wild animals in sanctuaries simply because those animals haven't been changed genetically over years to have humans as the focus of their primary relationship. So for them, their own social relationships are very, very important. Things like mating rituals and uh, maternal care relationships are an enormous source of social enrichment for animals kept in captivity. And if those um, relationships aren't provided for, then we can certainly see behavioral frustration. We also have the challenge of contraception in zoo animals. And this, again, is an area of emerging science and something that the St. Louis Zoo um, is doing a lot of work on. But for many years, for example, carnivores were um, chemically um, contracepted with um, a drug called Megistrol acetate. And a 10-year study showed that actually that drug has created enormous reproductive pathology in the car those captive carnivore population. 
and it's now not recommended to be used by zoos around the world. But it took 10 years of reproductive pathology to get to that situation. Now a different drug is being used, but because we don't have any information about it, it's a process of gathering that information as we use it, then we don't know what the side effects potentially of that drug will be. And it's certainly, in some species, um, there have been concerns raised that animals which are, have been contracepted with particular drugs don't return back to fertility, so they're not then able to breed in the future. So this is a real challenge if we want to maintain a captive breeding population. And if we carry on breeding animals, where do we then rehome those animals? Where do they go to if cup breeding and culling is not an acceptable alternative? And this is one of the big ethical challenges and welfare challenges that we have in terms of conservation management of populations, is that it appears in many species we need to keep them breeding in order to maintain both their, their social and behavioural needs, but also to maintain their reproductive health. Um, but if we keep on breeding, we then have a surplus population. And where do we put that surplus population? So this is a real challenge in, in zoo medicine at the moment. Great. Well, um, I think that one was uh, very well answered, but there's another question here. We're now starting to get them coming in on the boards here on the cage size. Do you want to? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, this is a question that actually comes up an awful lot in a lot of my work, um, normally from zoo directors <laughs> um, in different countries, because people like to, or, or from legislators and policy makers, um, because people like to have a minimum standard for enclosure size um, for different species. And the answer quite simply is that no, there isn't one, because providing for an animal's welfare needs is not just about space, it's about complexity. And I have seen the biggest leopard enclosure in Europe, and that leopard enclosure was enormous, but it was also essentially a football field. And leopards don't live in football fields, <laughs> they live uh, up in trees, um, in densely forested environments which are very complex. And so just giving a space requirement for an animal is not feasible because habitat is about much more than space and good enclosure design is about much more than space. It's about choice, it's about the animal having some control over its environment and it's certainly about complexity. In primates we would want to use three-dimensional space for example. Um, in reptiles as an absolute minimum standard, um, for example in snakes in the UK we um, would recommend that the snake is at least able to stretch out the length of its body and I see a lot of vivariums that don't even meet that requirement. Um, but that should certainly be a minimum for, for snakes. But for the majority of reptiles, what we should be looking for is whether the environment that we house them in provides them with all of the behavioural opportunities that they need, rather than just giving a minimum space requirement. Unfortunately, that does make policy development and legislation very difficult. I suppose, again, you can see parallels there with laying hens and uh, the cages that we were talking about in week four. Um, so we've seen policy changes so that the barren battery cage um, has been banned in uh, the European Union um, and instead by furnished cages. And these have things within them that are supposed to provide for the hens uh, behavioural needs, but of course it doesn't necessarily give the same space allowance that you would see a hen using if she was able to wander around outside. So uh, space and behavioural needs are, are slightly different from one another. What we need to know is, is how the animal experiences that. Are providing the behavioural needs enough or do they also need that space? And being able to do some kind of research to look at that um, does help us in understanding uh, how important space is to animals. Yes, there's definitely an element of space being important to, to some species. Mm -hmm. um, and the study that I showed this week uh, by Georgia Mason and Ros Club demonstrated that space is important, particularly to, to wide-ranging carnivores. But again, we have to look at the complexity of the types of experiences that they may experience in that type of space in the wild, rather than just looking at it as a space. A large barren space is going to be of very little use to any animal. So another one from the boards back in the week, uh, the one on unsuitable animals, Heather. So where am I looking? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I'm looking at the wrong screen. <laughs> so yeah. the one that was asking about, uh, for example, the oh yes, dolphins, porpoises, yes. Okay, right. So are there any species which are unsuitable to, uh, to be kept in captivity? And the example that was given on the discussion boards was that of cetaceans in captivity. 
Um, I think for any species managed in captivity, we have to look at the individual needs of the species and the evidence that we have uh, that we're able to meet the needs of that species. And any conservation or welfare issues which may arise whilst housing that species in captivity. One of the first questions I'd probably want to ask is, is the captive population self-sustaining? Um, because there are very few cases where it's ethically or scientifically justifiable to keep depopulating the wild in order to bring a species in, in, into captivity um, for us. If we cannot successfully sustain that species in captivity, then we're essentially just acting as a drain on the wild environment. Um, and my personal view is that that's not ethically justifiable from a welfare or a conservation perspective. We'd also want to look at the welfare of the animal in capture, in transport, and in housing and husbandry. Um, and um, we'd also be wanting to look at, well, if the animals aren't reproducing effectively in captivity to maintain a self-sustaining population, why is that? Because as we know, a poor welfare environment can inhibit reproduction through a number of different pathways, both behaviourally and physiologically. What do the animals need if we do manage them in captivity and can we provide that? And again, this comes back to our space, also our complexity. And one of the challenges, I think, in marine mammal or in cetacean management is providing a complex environment. Yes, these animals travel and they travel enormous distances that we really cannot comprehend in a captive environment. But they also um, interact with other species and also with um, their, their own conspecifics. They have enormous social groups that are incredibly complex, uh, largely matriarchal, and um, they travel enormous distances. And we know that for some of these species, they actually have distinct cultures and communication systems which don't necessarily integrate. So if we're keeping um, cetaceans that are sourced from different areas geographically around the world in the same type of environment, those animals aren't necessarily culturally the same. And again, this is an area of emerging research that's something that we've also seen in chimpanzees um, that may come from diverse regions of Africa. They have cultural differences um, and don't necessarily, we can't just sort of throw them all together and assume that they'll get on. The majority of cetaceans, of course, live their lives at significant depths um, and spend most of their time underwater. And there has been research that shows that cetaceans in captivity spend the majority of their time near the surface. Um, and this has been implicated in, in things like fin collapse in orcas. Um, and even the majority of enrichment that's been developed for, for cetaceans tends to be surface-based. So we very rarely see enrichment for cetaceans that's actually down underwater, which is where they would normally be. It tends to be balls and hoops and things that are, are provided for them on the surface. So we would want to question how appropriate that is at meeting their behavioural needs. We'd want to look at diseases of captivity, so things like dental disease in orcas, um, fin collapse potentially, um, as to whether that's a, a welfare problem. The research isn't really clear, but it's certainly something that we seem to see more frequently in some captive populations. Um, we'd also want to look at nutrition um, and lifespan, whether these animals are actually living as long in captivity as they are in the wild, and if they're not, then why not? We'd want to look at reproductive rates, potential for things like abortion, um, neonatal mortality is a useful welfare indicator, um, and successful reproduction. Of course, if we have a self-sustaining population, all of those things should uh, be going ahead uh, with no problems. Um, we'd also want to look at behavioural repertoires. Are we seeing any abnormal repetitive behaviours? That is always a sign that there is a... We could do physiological measures such as cortisol, potentially lymphocyte to neutrophil ratios or other physiological measures. And we'd always want to be asking ourselves, what does the animal experience? Why, why are we managing this animal? What's the conservation benefit? What's the welfare benefit? And do those things justify the maintenance of that animal in captivity? And that would be a, a, the way that we might build our, our ethical um, framework for whether we think that that's acceptable or not. We also, if we're looking at the ethical framework for whether we think it's acceptable, want to consider the human benefit. Is this animal an educational animal that is creating a human engagement process that will allow people to be more empathetic towards animals in the future? Um, but are we measuring those educational impacts? We can't just assume that because people are viewing an animal in any captive situation that it's automatically educational. We have to be able to measure that in some way. So what are those people learning? And is that learning or that increased knowledge improving their attitudes or changing their behaviours to make them more likely to conserve animals in the wild? So we might want to measure, for example, how many people visiting 
particular species in captivity um, then go on to contribute financially or in, um, perform some kind of behavioral change such as not buying palm oil in the case of orangutans um, that make them um, actually um, promote the conservation of that animal. So by asking those kinds of questions and co considering those kinds of issues we can consider whether we think that animal is uh, suitable to be kept in a particular environment, in a particular institution, in any captive environment, in any institution, or not at all. Uh, and certainly there are some species which we don't keep in captivity. Yeah. Ah, yes. We haven't really had much discussion on circuses this week, so I think it would probably be good to answer a circus question. So the question is, has it been possible to provide good animal welfare to wild animals in circuses, or is it the only way to ban the use of animals in circuses? I think that's a really good question because, again, circuses are something which is often very emotional and very controversial. So to start with, I'd like to make two distinctions. Um, we use the term circus universally. We need to distinguish between traveling circuses and static circuses. Both are primarily of um, performances, but both present different welfare challenges. So, for example, um, in the UK and across Europe, there's been a lot of campaigning against the use of wild animals in traveling circuses. This does not safeguard the welfare of wild animals in static circuses. It also doesn't consider the welfare of domestic animals in any type of circus. Um, and so I think if we're concerned about animal welfare, we need to be concerned about all types of practices within an industry rather than just focusing on particular elements. Um, in the UK at the moment, I believe there are two licensed circuses and a ban is looking to come in next year, I believe. Um, those two circuses that are licensed um, do travel, they're both travelling circuses, and the ban would be against travelling circuses in the UK. It wouldn't deal with static circuses or static animal performances. Um, as far as I'm aware, we have very little in the way of wild animals in circuses in the UK. Uh, my understanding is that the circuses, the two circuses which currently use wild animals use um, zebra and also a python. The welfare of animals like the python are really, really difficult to evaluate because we don't have robust welfare measures for reptiles. But um, if the animal is used to being handled and is not being physically exerted, which is pretty unlikely for a python in a performance, um, and its housing and husbandry are um, assessed, which they have to be for the licensing and evaluated, then I would expect that it is actually possible in some cases for some animals to be um, maintained in a, a reasonably a reasonable welfare environment even within the framework of a circus. Similarly for um, some animals that um, may be uh, very used to human interactions or have a very positive human animal relationship they may not find that performance element stressful. A lot of it depends on how that performance is delivered whether it's delivered through positive or negative reinforcement or punishment training because that can be a source of stress or not depending on the animal depends on the human-animal interaction and it depends on whether the animal can cope with being in an environment that um, lots and lots of involves lots and lots of people and an audience members being around it and that's obviously can be potentially very stressful. It also depends on whether the animal can cope with confinement. A lot of traveling circuses during the winter don't travel and those animals are confined to relatively small areas. Um, when the circuses do travel, then travelling and transport can be an additional stress. They may travel by rail, again, confinement, lack of exercise, lack of um, daylight, etc., etc. We also have nutritional challenges, but they would be the same as for any other captive environment. So the challenges within a circus environment are different. Uh, it's important to understand the specific context of the circus. Um, and important to understand that when we're talking about developing policy, at the moment, the discussion only seems to be around travelling circuses. And yet the focus of the discussion is often on performances. Mm -hmm. And those two things are not mutually exclusive. You can still display wild animals in a performance situation, in a static situation. And at the moment, that's not being discussed from a welfare perspective in terms of policy development. And I think that that's potentially quite a big gap if we're concerned about performance for, from an animal's welfare perspective. So we could consider any performances undertaken in zoos, faulconry displays, that sort of All thing. All of these things. In the UK, we also have um, educational displays of animals that may, so for example, reptiles or birds that may travel to schools mm -hmm. for handling sessions, for handling interactions. Those potentially could be classed as traveling wild animals. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we have um, husbandry demonstrations in zoos. Those probably wouldn't be affected because they're static demonstrations. But at the moment, there would be theoretically nothing stopping zoos delivering some of these types of, of, of performances if they wanted to, um, simply because they're a static institution. And so we need to look not just at the the logistics of moving animals around, although travelling can be a significant welfare challenge, we also need to look at whether we think performances are a problem and what aspects of those performances might be a problem. Which leads very nicely into a question from Becky Wells on the boards uh, from the other day, um, where she asks, we have a lot of working animals in our world, and so you could imagine that these circus animals that are performing could be classed as working animals, perhaps, yeah. uh, which uh, but also can include horses and donkeys and whatnot working um, all over the world and dogs in various situations and uh, she wonders is it anthropomorphic to say that they enjoy their jobs or benefit from working or is it anthropomorphic to say it's cruel to make them work or both should the criteria for all working animals be welfare based and it's slightly off topic no captive welfare it absolutely wildlife, feeds into that though um, in terms of not just animals used in performances but also husbandry demonstrations mm -hmm. and even for things like enrichment I've actually had people tell me that they believe enrichment of zoo animals is cruel because it makes the animals work and actually what we should be doing is just providing them with a bowl of food uh, so they don't have to move or um, you know have to use any energy or, or effort to find their food and so we have to deal with all of these differing perspectives I'm going to come back to uh, one of my mantras which is choice choice and control are fundamentally important for animal welfare if an animal has a choice to work and is not forced to work if an animal has a choice to perform or if an animal has a choice to engage in enrichment and isn't forced, if it actively enjoys that process, then of course that's a welfare benefit. And there's actually a term for this in animal welfare which is called contra-freeloading. So freeloading is the process by which we get something for nothing. Contra-freeloading is the opposite of that. It's working for something and then getting the satisfaction and the reward of achieving something. And we do see this in, for example, enrichment situations, some positive reinforcement training situations, and potentially for things like working border collies or some of our working equids. Of course, there's always going to be a limit to that. If an animal is exhausted, if it doesn't get a timely reward for its behaviour, or if it's frustrated by um, what's expected of it, then that can become a negative experience. And so at all times it's important that the animal has the choice whether to engage in that type of activity or not. Uh, and if it doesn't want to engage, that it's provided with an alternative. So um, contra freeloading is, is actually really important in our understanding of animal welfare because we know that animals don't want to be lazy. They enjoy engaging in activities such as foraging or climbing or swimming. And it's important that we provide behavioural opportunities for them to be able to do those things. Okay, well, uh, there's another question here from Christina on um, hand rearing of offspring of exotic animals in zoos. Okay, so again this doesn't just apply to zoos, it applies to any facility where captive animals might be hand reared and you saw some examples of that in uh, this week's uh, educational videos. Um, hand rearing is absolutely a welfare challenge. As you heard in previous weeks, um, we know that stress and maternal separation can have long-term impacts on how species develop in terms of their cognitive function and their ability to adapt and cope with different environmental challenges. Um, EASA, the European Association of Zoos and Aquaria, generally recommend that zoos do not hand rear unless the species is of high conservation value. And that's bearing in mind the fact that we know that hand rearing often creates problems. If zoos do choose to hand rear, or if sanctuaries choose to hand rear, then it's really important that they have the facilities to be able to deal with particular species. And it can absolutely be done successfully in some cases. So, for example, um, the Mountain Gorilla Veterinary Project, which is an in situ conservation project in Rwanda at Ugango, which safeguards the population, the wild population of mountain gorillas left in Africa, and is supported by many zoos in terms of its conservation funding. Um, also, um, support a, a small group of orphan gorillas, eastern lowland and mountain gorillas, um, which have been um, confiscated from poachers after they've been separated from their groups um, through the act of poaching. Um, 
the Mountain Gorilla Veterinary Project um, hires staff that are dedicated to raising those orphans. And those orphans are raised in a, a dedicated facility um, and have absolute round-the-clock care. They have fresh foods brought in from the forest so that they're eating wild foods. And the hope is that they will be rehabilitated back to the wild when they're a bit older and better able to cope with themselves. But all of their husbandry and management is very much geared around supporting their emotional and behavioural development to the extent that they'll have caregivers with them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Because in terms of a gorilla's social contact, um, that physical presence is really, really important. Go back 50 years ago in the UK and we had a primate hand rearing situation um, that some of you, if you're familiar, if you're from the UK, you may be familiar with a brand of tea called PG Tips. And uh, we actually used to hand rear chimps that were taken from their mothers at an early age. And those chimps were then used in t television adverts and performances um, as the PG Tips chimps. And that you can probably YouTube videos of these guys. And looking back on it, it does look pretty dated. Unsurprisingly, those chimpanzees brought up as mini humans in a semi-entertainment style environment grew up with significant behavioral problems. Um, the surviving members of, of that group of chimps are now housed at a zoo in the UK um, and after um, significant efforts at behavioural rehabilitation have been socialised to an extent where they're able to live in, in social groups. But that's something that's only actually happened relatively recently and those chimpanzees still do have significant behavioural issues. So when we look at hand rearing it's important that we consider not just that we want to do good, we want to save a cute baby animal, but we look at actually whether we're able to do good from the animal's perspective. Are we able to give the animal a quality of life? This is often more successful if we have a group of orphan animals and they have conspecific interactions that can help to stimulate their cognitive development and their normal behaviours. Often raising an animal in isolation in a human oriented environment such as the types of environments that we might see in some exotic pet situations and particularly in the United States for primates um, can have fairly significant negative impacts on those animals for the rest of their lives. And this can lead to some of the um, cases of aggression that we see, for example, with chimpanzees as they get older um, and become sexually mature and no longer um, are suitable to be housed as pets in, in a human-oriented environment. And that can have significant negative welfare consequences. It's interesting, isn't it, from, um, from those animals with a severe conservation status, uh, we've gone come quite a long way now from moving away from hand rearing uh, in somebody's house wearing a nappy into mm. trying to make the situation as as natural as possible. And when we think of some of the birds, for example, that are hand reared, they are actually reared by puppets that are very similar to the adult type of bird, yeah. so that those birds get no contact with humans, even though they're humans dressed as as mm -hmm. cranes, for example. Yeah. And we can see those those type of reintroduction programs where the animals are hand reared, but are hand reared extraordinarily carefully to minimise human contact as being much more successful. I think my first question would always be, why is hand rearing necessary? If hand rearing is necessary because mm -hmm. there's been a failure in mother rearing because the mother is stressed or upset in some way and doesn't feel able to cope with rearing her own offspring, I would be questioning the husbandry regimes of the particular institution and be trying to promote an environment where mother rearing is supported and that's really what all zoos should be working towards. Rather than trying to fix individuals um, that may be rejected by their mothers and focus on hand rearing better, ideally what we want to do is promote mother rearing. Having said that, there are some species, such as birds, where hand rearing can be very successful. And it's common practice in zoos to do something that we call double clutching, which is removing the first set of eggs from a bird so that she then lays a second set. And she will rear that second set, and we will incubate the first set, and they will be reared according to very stringent and specific guidelines. Um, and that's done because it's important for some um, endemic species of birds where we have very, very small numbers of these birds to try and support the population growth as much as possible by increasing the number of eggs that are laid and the number of chicks that are reared. And that can actually be very successful in some species. So again, it's important that we don't generalise, but we look at the, the individual species. Uh, yeah. Do you want to mention about sanctuaries? Yep. Yeah. Oh, and just to say that sanctuaries, again, are often more likely to hand rear um, than zoos. Often they're set up for it, so similar to the mountain gorilla example that I gave you, and the cubs that you saw with the enrichment, um, the, two, the two cubs, Misty and Rain, at the Animals Asia Sanctuary in Vietnam. Um, 
and often they'll have conspecifics. Those animals will have been seized from trade or from poaching and have come from uh, quite a traumatic background, but are often grouped together um, and housed and have a very focused behavioural management and enrichment programme, which allows their hand rearing to be done more successfully. Difficult, I think, often in a zoo environment, when you don't have specialised facilities or when you don't have um, a, a particular environment that's geared towards giving you the privacy and the behavioural complexity needed for successful hand rearing. It's also important, I think, when we consider hand rearing, as I said, that we consider why it's necessary. Um, we do have some species that are traditionally, uh, there's a lot of human intervention in, in them being reared, such as the giant pandas. They're a classic example. Um, and often we actually induce maternal separation by separating them from their mothers at quite a young age. Um, it's a diff difficult ethical dilemma because in the wild, one of two panda, two panda cubs are born, one would naturally die, and the mother would focus on raising one. In captivity, we don't want to allow that to happen, and so we are twin swapping and, and hand raising to a, a much greater extent. But that can have knock-on effects in terms of the cognitive and behavioural ability of those animals to cope with their environment and also their potential reproductive success in the future as well and that's certainly one of the challenges that we face with giant pandas. Okay I think it's probably time just for a couple of quick other questions. There's one here that's sort of about the domestication of um, captive animals in zoos. So looking at the silver fox example. Okay. And, and whether, whether, they, whether animals in zoos become domesticated. Um, certainly animals in zoos are not selected for domestication through any overt process and um, I think somebody mentioned on the discussion boards earlier this week that actually if um, zoo animals are part of a European breeding program or they're part of an SSP in the, in the US, what we're trying to conserve is about 95% of the genetic diversity over 50 years so we don't really want to lose any genetic diversity. Animals are actually bred to promote that genetic diversity rather than according to any temperament or personality changes. However, in some species, as I mentioned earlier, we also have to remember that the populations that we currently have come from populations which were traditionally collected from the wild and where the animals that didn't cope with captivity um, essentially died because early zoos would have been a lot more challenging to live with than, than modern zoos. So to an extent, our current zoo population has already been selected for animals which can cope in captivity. Um, there has been some research that's been done on um, looking at morphological differences um, and this was done at the National Museums of Scotland by Dr Andrew Kitchener and he looked at lion skulls in zoos across Europe and compared these with the uh, lions in, uh, from the, I think from the Serengeti but from some region of Africa and actually there are some morphological differences in that captive lion skulls tend to be slightly smaller, uh, slightly smaller muscle attachments, et cetera, et cetera. So even though we're not actively selectively breeding for morphological differences, unfortunately just by the process of managing animals in a captive situation, we have ultimately selected for the ones that can cope with that situation. Um, I think zoos pay a lot of attention now towards population genetics and certainly animals which um, have perhaps come into the captive environment in the, more recently would probably be less susceptible to those kind of selection challenges. I certainly don't believe that animals have behaviourally been significantly changed from their wild counterparts. Um, if they had then zoo reintroduction programmes would essentially not be effective and we know that certainly um, they can be effective and the Howlett's Gorilla program is an excellent example of that gorilla population which has lived in captivity for uh, a number of generations which has been successfully reintroduced into the wild and there are lots of other examples of that type of, of thing happening as well so um, while there might be a, an element of inadvertent selection I think it's very important that we still pay attention to the behavioural needs of those animals in captivity. Um, there was one more actually which is about inbreeding depression, just talking about selective breeding. So somebody asked on the discussion boards about inbreeding depression and whether it was possible to um, support, to develop um, a successful captive breeding program if um, an animal's population had been reduced to a very small number. Mm -hmm. and this has actually occurred in the wild in a couple of examples. So the Californian condor is one example um, and actually the cheetah is another and that went through um, an inbreeding depression um, a couple of hundred years ago so it's nothing to do with sort of modern conservation issues. The cheetah used to range across Europe and Asia and all across Africa and, and as we now know it's, its range is dramatically reduced and so 
um, the number of individuals that contribute to that population have also significantly reduced. What we see when there's a massive population reduction and our breeding population is limited to a few individuals is what we call inbreeding depression. This means that you get um, a resurgence of any problems, any genetic defects within that population. The population can then go through one of two things. It either becomes extinct because the genetic problems that have developed don't allow that population to survive, or it goes through a process that we call purging. And this is where all of the individuals within that population that have a genetic defect die off, and they leave a smaller population of genetically very, very healthy, but usually quite similar individuals. And it is then possible to repopulate from that healthy purged population. And that's what happened with the cheetah through um, just a natural selection process and also with the Californian condor which was um, face extinction due to, to human influences. So whilst those animals are now genetically similar to the extent where you can actually allograft cheetahs, you can remove an area of skin from one part of a cheetah and transplant that onto another cheetah and that cheetah will accept that tissue without rejection because they're so genetically similar. Um, we, um, we, we know that the cheetah population, because they're so genetically similar, are more at risk of infectious disease threats because they don't have the genetic variation that means that if a disease hit the population that some would survive and some would succumb to it. The chances are that because they're so similar they would all succumb to that disease. And it's a similar risk for any other um, population that's gone through that inbreeding depression and purging um, genetic process. Okay, well, there's probably just time for the last question then. So there's a question from uh, Patricia uh, about crocodiles. She says, here in Ecuador, there is a government division that goes around the country taking exotic pets off the hands of their owners. <laughs> and um, since they're kept as pets, they probably wouldn't make it in the wild, she says, but they're sent to a sanctuary. What about reintroduction of confiscated species? Yeah, again, another big, another big challenge. Um, we know that uh, zoos and sanctuaries around the world are saturated often, and many zoos and sanctuaries are involved in wildlife rescue and rehabilitation. Um, it's really, really important, both from a conservation and a welfare perspective, that we look towards good practice guidance for those practices. And the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation, um, do have um, good practice guidance for the reintroduction of confiscated species. And they actually have an algorithm uh, which you can use which looks at the resources you may have available and the type of um, provision you can make for the animal's welfare and helps you to make a decision about whether that animal is suitable for reintrodu reintroduction into the wild, whether it should remain for the rest of its life in captivity or whether it would be better to be humanely euthanized. And the IUCN recommends that um, animals are only reintroduced into, into the wild in quite specific circumstances and this is irrespective of their species. We need to know that those animals can feed themselves, that there's enough food available in the habitat, that the habitat is not at maximum carrying capacity, so we need to do a habitat survey, because if we reintroduce an animal into an area where there are already lots of those animals, there may not be enough food, there may be competition for mates, there may be aggress aggressive interactions that result in the death or um, injury of one of those animals. And so it's, impo it's important that all of these things are evaluated. We look at the habitat, we look at the existing populations of animals in that habitat. The animals that are released should be screened for infectious diseases to make sure we're not reintroducing diseases into a wild area because they may be carrying diseases from their, the captive environment that they've experienced. And so all of those things are really, really important um, to be evaluated before we put an animal back into the wild. It's one of the reasons that reintroduction programs are so long and time consuming and expensive because we have to consider not just whether we have enough animals to put them back into the wild, but also whether they're fit to go back, whether they may create a disease problem, whether they are endemic to that particular area, whether they are, are of the right subspecies or genetic makeup for that particular area, um, and whether there's enough resources in that habitat to be able to support them into the future. So it, it is a very complex process. Well, that's probably it in terms of time. I'm afraid so. If anybody else has any other questions, um, if you want to post them on the Week 5 Google Hangout discussion board, um, I'll be checking that board over the next week or so, and I'll be really happy to answer them. Um, otherwise, um, you can always contact us by email. We're very happy to hear from you. OK, well, thanks, everybody, for listening. And bye-bye for now. Have a great weekend. Bye.